in your own country. So you don't need to import so much. Yeah, I'm taking bicycles where you, you, you know that there's still bicycles where you use your legs? <laughs> I'm, I'm really surprised. I see all these young people that have these electrical bikes. Why? Because it's stupid. stupid. Huh? And laziness. It's laziness. It's not here because most of, the, most of the year it's too hot in Israel. And you, want to, you don't want to, be to come to places where no, it's are sweating. Wet. Okay. Okay. What about the winter day? They leave the winter day, they turn off so the electricity? I, 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 no. Not no. It's a hot country, it's true. But if you go very fast, then it becomes cool <laughs> with the wind. Very cool. So anyway, if you are thinking about buying a bike, really, you know, if you're not going to work, for example, with your bike, if you just have it for moving around, then think about this. Do I want an electrical bike or do I want a normal bike that keeps me fit? Quite healthy. Aside from that, kind of, you still need to use your legs. It's less dangerous. It goes not so fast. So the near enemy to compassion is pity, which keeps others at a distance. Kind of, oh wow, look at this poor guy down there, you know. I'm glad I'm not in his situation. Yeah? If that person would be your son or your father or whoever, you wouldn't feel like this. Yeah, it's this distance, again, it's a self-centeredness kind of, it's okay. Again, don't take it to the extreme. It is okay to feel happy about your good situation. But then also with the thought, I want to make something out of my good situation. Yeah, I want to use it for whatever you want to use it. In general, a spiritual practitioner, it is to, to develop love, compassion, and wisdom. Because now I have the opportunity to do it because the suffering is not so big. And then also put some effort into it. Yeah, so it's okay to be happy about this situation, but you're not comparing it with the other. Okay. Again, you can do that when you are very depressed and you know complaining all the time, then you see the relativity of it, and then you look at somebody that is much worse off, but then you leave that other person alone, and you think, oh wow, I could, I could also be in such a situation. So again, it's not that you're not so separate. You start to understand, I could be in that situation, but I'm not. So let me do something with my life, okay? So you see, that's the problem about, now I'm using the word again about Buddhism. Buddhism is so complex. It's not a black and white thing. In this situation you do this, and then you do this, and then you do this. It's not like this. It depends on so many factors, how you react, whether the, the imprint that we're making on our mind stream with habitual uh, instincts and whatever, is, will be positive or negative. It, it depends on so many things. Yeah? And in, in one situation, it's very appropriate to react like this, and that's the antidote, and in other situation, it's the exact opposite. Because we are functioning on a relative level, and on this relative level, there's nothing that is true, really true, it is just relatively true, okay? So we don't need to fight so much about what is true so what is not, nothing is true really true. Depends from where you look at it. Yeah. And there is some truth, like Nagarjuna said, whatever leads to happiness for all beings, that is true. Nice. Yeah. Whatever leads to happiness, that is true. Whatever leads to suffering is fake. Oh, okay. So the opposite um, of compassion, of course, is cruelty or wanting others to suffer. So then a result, what, what, what you try to avoid is sentimentality, kind of suffering with the other, you know. I don't know if you ever noticed when uh, I had a broken wrist at one point, and I never heard so much about other people's broken limbs than when I was walking around with this manchette here. Everybody was telling me about their broken limbs, so. Uh, and why this happens is because, again, it's about, we, they, we see the suffering of somebody else, it reminds us of our own, and then we get stuck there. Instead of just going, but mine is finished, why do I need to tell this person? Yeah? And you just listen. Yeah? Empathy is like, 
just listening, just being there with an open heart, the wish to, for them to be free from suffering. That's all. Then if you can do something, by all means do. But very often we cannot, yeah? But we can make them relax. Hmm. Is that part of compassion? Huh? Is it, this is part of compassion? Listening? Yeah. With the wish for them to be free from suffering. But as I said, compassion needs to have wisdom because sometimes there's nothing we can do, but we can be there, we can be witness to their suffering without, you know, kind of vomiting all our suffering upon them. I don't know, maybe the self-centeredness, why are we doing this? It's such a, an obsessive thing, isn't it? Instead of really listening to what the others said, we have this urge, probably thinking, if I show this person that my suffering is bigger, then that makes them feel better. Higher? Yeah? We are not in competition with suffering here. What about showing them that it can be different? Huh? Like you said, you were drinking. Yeah. And you go to somebody who's drinking too. Yeah. And you can say, I was drinking and now I'm drinking. Ooh. That is a bit condescending. Much better to say, I know what it means. If the person asks how did you get how did you get free from it, then I can say something. Otherwise, no. I don't even say that I was an alcoholic. Also, I want to say something in case we have some people here with alcohol alcoholics and, and anonymous AA. They they teach them to say I'm a recovering alcoholic. I think I can claim I'm not a recovering alcoholic. I have recovered. I think you can make that step, not needing it anymore. It needs a lot of courage. And, uh, and the good thing is I can try it out, whether it works or not, because we have rituals where we have to drink a little bit of alcohol. So at the beginning, I still felt this warmth kind of going down the throat and, um, and the, the need to wish for more, but because I have a vow of not, to, not drinking alcohol, I kind of pretty much protected. So. Um, so now I do this, it's absolutely not a problem. I can also take medicines who are in space, have alcohol, like homeopathic medicines. So I think I have recovered. I think you can. Mm. But yeah, I mean, um, as I'm saying, I don't need to say, tell them. You know, if I really know how it feels, I don't need to say. They feel it, do they? People understand. Yeah. Empathy means you know what it means to be in the shoes of this person, but then when you go, you give the shoes back because you, it's not him, or you're not him, or you, you, you know, or her. It's complicated. It's really complicated. So don't think that this is you know you can do a two-day thing and then you know about compassion and love and all this. Yeah. And how you discover what is right and what is wrong is by looking inside. It's the only way, not from reading books. There's so many books on love and compassion, and there's so little real love and compassion in the world. Because we, it gets stuck up here, and then we feel bad about not being compassionate by not understanding how difficult this actually is. Okay. Sympathetic joy. The definition, being happy with somebody's fortune and happiness. Um, so, yeah, so it's quite simple. So the near enemy is hypocrisy. That kind of you praise somebody, but you don't really feel anything and all this, and it, it looks as if you're happy with them, but you're not. Okay? Do you, do you understand that? Mm -hmm. uh, I have to speed up a little bit here, I see, because we have to eat at 5 o'clock. Uh, but then we have the whole night, actually. Today, so it's okay, we can continue a bit in the evening. Um, so, um, the, near, the, the opposite is jealousy. The opposite is jealousy. The opposite of sympathetic joy, when I see that you're really well, you know. And you can do that also, going through the street. When you see somebody who seems really, really well, you go, oh, how wonderful, there's somebody who's really happy. But when you're depressed, or when you're stuck in your problems, it's so difficult, and you get angry at people who are happy. Isn't it? Like, deep down. Have you ever noticed that? Mm -hmm. 
You don't allow them to be happy, especially if it's your friends, because they have no compassion. Here I am, suffering, and they're laughing, and they're having a good time. How dare they? Yeah, so we give them sympathetic joy is happy when, when others are happy. So sympathetic joy is a great antidote to depression for oneself as well, but this should not be the main goal. Right? The main goal is just, again, not because I want to use this as an antidote. The main goal is to learn to rejoice with others. Jealousy can be quite painful, you know, when others are jealous of you. It's like poison, in a way. It's poisoning happiness, yeah? Like wet blanket. But actually, if somebody is jealous of you, you should be happy. Yeah. Why? Because it means you have qualities that they're jealous about. So, no, not happy because they're jealous, but you can say, well, I must have something that is good, instead of complaining. We usually feel attacked by people who are jealous, isn't it? They're seeing your good qualities. So it's okay. Okay. I know it's a bit radical what I'm saying, but um, uh, you can. It's, it's a all this is all this is to try out, huh? It's threatening. Is it? But how? I, when somebody is jealous. Of what is so threatening about this? <laughs> Yeah, think about it, exactly. He's attacking you, right? He's attacking your good qualities. Yeah. You can think like, wow, they see qualities. That's why they're jealous. Yeah. We see it as threatening because also they try to destroy our happiness. That is what is threatening. That's why we're afraid. But if you are not affected by the jealousy, they, no way they can destroy your happiness. Also, when you feel that somebody is jealous, this again, we could talk a whole, in Far Monash, we'll talk about jealousy and arrogance on one of the weekends. Um, if you feel that somebody is jealous of you, what does our self centeredness do in general? What do we do? Yeah, see, you don't know what to do. What do we do? Step back. Huh? Step back. Yeah, we attack back. Exactly. That's what we do in general. Step back. Oh, step back. We step back, we get frightened, we close up. But also we attack back sometimes. And also, somehow, the self-centeredness, again, in a perverse way, quite likes it. And it goes and parades in front of their noses to show off how patient we are, how not affected by the jealousy we are. I am not hurt by your jealousy because I love you so much. Also sometimes that, the, maybe not you, but the self-centeredness is doing it. So when you feel that somebody's jealous of you, don't parade your good qualities in front of them. Admit your mistakes that you're making. Ask them for help, something that they know better. <laughs> I see people cringing. But yeah, it needs a lot of courage to do that. All this needs courage, okay? But if your heart is open, you might have the courage to do it. Praise them, because they're lacking something. They're unhappy. That's why they're jealous. Praise them for the things, not, not unrealistic praise for things that they can't do. Praise them for things that they are good at doing. <laughs> okay. So equanimity is a state of mind that doesn't distinguish between friend, enemy, or like friend, antagonist, or a nice person, not nice person, and not interesting person. Maybe more better words for that. That see everybody is equal. Sees everybody is equal. That is equanimity, and that is also. Uh, we will do the meditation this evening a little bit on these four immeasurables, especially on equanimity. And it is um, necessary in order to have this unconditional love and this unconditional compassion, first we have to create some equanimity. And that's the most difficult step. I see you squinting your eyes. You, is it because you don't understand the word equanimity or? 
The lady behind the bed. Yeah. Are you what you're thinking? Yeah. It's a big step that also is very difficult to do because again we have this instinct, people are nice to us, we like them, they're not nice to us, instinctively we dislike them. Then again the filter is, is there, you know, they should be happy, these no, and these other ones, you know. Do you, I mean, there are so many beings on this planet and I, I am just a tiny, 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 tiny particle amongst all these beings. And I have an instinct that my happiness is more important than all these other people's happiness. So that's what we start to question, this instinctive thinking. My happiness is more important than that of others. And then to, to try to, to really see everybody has a right to be happy. May they be happy. May they be free from suffering. And may they also develop equanimity, free from attachment to those that we hold some close, because that's dangerous, because it's exactly those people who hurt us the most. Because we trust them. You know, when a friend is kind of misusing your trust or hurts you or whatever it does, I don't know what, that hurts much more than somebody that you dislike. It's much easier to let go of people that you didn't like from the beginning because you were expecting it. But people that you love, so-called, supposedly, when they kind of turn against you, wow, that goes deep, very deep, yeah? Because we're too close to them, there's attachment. Again, the, the, the attached mind, what, you know, calculates or thinks that they will be here for me forever. And then the hurt comes when we see reality. And then we are disappointed or disenchanted, and that's a good thing, because we see that, you know, relationships break. You're not the only one. Many, many relationships break. So we see it happening all around us, isn't it? Relationships breaking. Yet, when it happens to us, do we spontaneously go saying, yeah, well, it happens to everybody. <laughs> no, why me? As if it would only happen to us, then we react. Okay, so I have 10 minutes to explain about the vows. <laughs> or about ethical conduct. So again, ethical conduct, there can be rules or vows or, uh, no, vows, no, but it can be like a list of don't do this, don't do that, don't do that, don't do that. But basically the ethical conduct that we're trying to adhere by is like you set your target, kind of. I have to say, your expectation of the behavior of others, their ethical conduct, uh -huh. then we know how we should behave. It's as simple as that. Do you, do you see what I mean? Our expectation towards others of having ethical conduct is they should be all gods or Buddhas or whatever. They should never cheat me. They should never lie to me. They should never, of course, not kill me. They should never take my partner. They should never do this, da, 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 da. Isn't it? We have this expectation. If you, don't, if you say, if you think you don't have it, and you have the slightest frustration when somebody does it to you, that means you're fooling yourself. If somebody, if I lie to you, or I say, yes, 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 I will help you, and then I don't turn up, let's say, make a promise, and I don't turn up, and you say, yeah, of course, you know, not everybody keeps their promise, and you just keep on working, then it's true, you have no expectations that people keep their promises. Are we like this? No way. Yeah, so again, the meditation, we start to see how we are. So we have very, very high expectations for others, but then for ourselves, we're quite flaky in our ethical behavior. We're very ethical when it's cheap, when it doesn't cost much, and, it does, and it's not difficult. Then it's nice. But when we have to pay, or when it's uncomfortable, or we have to give up things, then the interest in ethical conduct is not so big anymore. 
And that goes for everybody, and that's a shame. And where does it come from? Because we have very short-term vision, and we don't think about climate. We don't think that the actions we do now, they will have consequences in the future. Yeah? We're not thinking about long-term consequences. That, that goes also for the environment. That goes for many things, you know, we say, oh, it could go by at the moment, yeah, it's, it's a problem, but it, it seems to work. And we, we're not, we have no interest in changing anything, because, yeah, at the moment it's okay. Yeah. It's a bit like this, we are, yeah. because we don't think about long-term consequences. So ethical conduct basically means not to harm anybody, voluntarily, by thinking it's a good thing to harm them. They deserve it. So there's this very simple list of not killing, not you not allowed to, but the, the list of negative actions. Killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, which means forcing somebody, taking somebody's partner, or sleeping with, an, with somebody else when you already have a partner. Then lying, um, kind of divisive speech, or slandering, like you rumors about others that are could be true, but then you do this with a lot of pleasure. Um, harsh words, like you know, using your speech to harm somebody, either by the meaning of the words or by the, your tone. And then meaningless talk, which is gossip. And then we have um, covetousness or envy, being envious about other people's um, possessions, having negative thoughts like really wanting them to suffer and then wrong views, holding on to wrong views. So this is the list of the 10 negative actions. Body and speech, easy to understand, mind a little bit more difficult. In the Lam Rim uh, course we will go more into that. We don't have the time to kind of take this apart. So is it easy to keep pure ethical conduct? Question to you. No. 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 Do we have a lot of interest in keeping ethical conduct. Sometimes. Part of it. Do we have enough interest? I don't think so. Not even me, you know, because also we don't see what's lying ahead of us. So, but at least when we take this as a hypothesis, this whole thing about karma, when people ask me, do you believe in it? It could be true. And if I see if I take it that it is true as a hypothesis and I become more ethical, I also see it's better for me already now, actually. Yeah. And then if it's true that it also has like some implications in the future, then all the better. If it doesn't, I haven't lost anything by being ethical, okay? Because I feel better about myself, not cheating and especially not harming others. Yeah. So in order to be more protected, we are taking vows. We're making a promise. And for that, we need, in Buddhism, one takes the Buddha. Like the Buddha, one visualizes the Buddha is giving us these vows, form of like light or whatever. Like first you decide, yes, I want to take these vows, and then uh, one takes these vows. So we have like text here, there's a, a small ritual that one does, takes about half an hour. So if you're not Buddhist, you can still kind of do something that applies to what you believe. But I think it's good, you know, not just to make the promise to the empty space in front of you for 20, because we take them for 24 hours only, okay? Normally they're, taking in, they're taken in the morning because the Buddhist day starts in the morning. Now your day starts in the evening, so we adjust. We can do that. I can also leave out some parts of the ritual. It's not so important because you're not Buddhist and you don't believe in it anyway. The main thing is that you say to yourself, or you kind of, as if you're receiving these vows from somebody that you, it's good to have something transcendental, not just an ordinary being, but it can also be an, a, a human being. That you say, for 24 hours, I will not kill, steal, and there's eight of them actually. So I will not, so that I'm telling you the right formula. So from now on until the same time tomorrow, 
I shall not kill, steal others' possessions, engage in sexual activity. So for these 24 hours, is all sexual activity. It's 24 hours. Um, or speak false words. This is why we keep you in silence, so you, it's easy to keep the vow. Okay? I shall avoid intoxicants, from which many mistakes arise. So intoxicants are drugs, alcohol. Sometimes people ask me, what about coffee? Well, if you think the coffee makes you go mad, yeah, then please don't drink coffee. But then <laughs> It's not. I mean, it's not an intoxicant. You can be attached to coffee the same as you can be attached to work. But it's not an intoxicant. It's an object of attachment. So if you or smoking or things like that, I mean, smoking cigarettes, tobacco, it's usually not considered an intoxicant, but it's also harmful. So you can include that. We can be very creative here. You can include it, and if you if you want to give up smoking, for example, say, okay, the next 24 hours, I will not smoke. Um, I will. I shall not sit on large, high, or expensive beds. So here also is absolutely not a problem. So you see, you get the benefit of holding a vow of having very comfortable beds in the future because taking vows creates positive energy. So then you get these things naturally. So, wow, you take a vow of not uh, sitting on large, high, or expensive beds or thrones, actually, sometimes also. It comes from the East. Because in, uh, you know, the Maharajas and these people, they were sitting on kind of very comfortable divans. They're cold, with, like covered with uh, lion skin or, or, or leopard, uh, tiger skin or whatever. So then you say, no, because it's a form of arrogance, because the low people sit on the floor. Yeah, so for us, it doesn't really mean that much. <coughs> uh, so there you have the benefit of having one vow, easy to keep, can't break it here, impossible. Um, I shall not eat food at the wrong times. So because it's Yom Kippur tomorrow, so you make the decision uh, what you want to do, whether you want to do full fast, full Yom Kippur fast, or whether you want to do the Buddhist fast, which is you will not have breakfast, but you'll have lunch and you'll have uh, then seven o'clock dinner. If you want dinner, it's like very simple food, so then we can also go home. Um, so you decide for yourself what you, what kind of vows you want to take. The Buddhist ones or the Jewish ones or your own ones, like you say, uh, you know, whatever, I don't know. Um, so in the Buddhist, Fast vows you can drink, but not full milk, not undi undi undiluted milk and juices that have pulp in it. But you can drink as much as you want. Water is the best. We also have practices where we fast 24 hours, do a lot of prostrations at the same time. So that, but it's not that one. This is called eight Mahayana precepts. Um, I shall not eat food at the wrong time, so these wrong times you decide what they are for you. I shall avoid singing, dancing, playing music, and I shall not wear perfumes, garlands, or ornaments. These are our objects of attachment, and we also identify with them, like the jewelry that we're wearing, or the, the you know, parfum, the parfum that we're putting on, and the, the makeup and all this. So it's for 24 hours that we, you, so you're very free to either come, and just listen. Uh, what time is it? At um, it's tomorrow. At seven o'clock. Okay, because it's two hours from now. So just listen. And what the heck is this all about? It's okay. There's nothing secret about it. But try not to get angry. You know, if you are thinking that you're kind of hurting your own religious beliefs by being here that don't come. That's fine. And uh, if you want to take these vows, you can, and you can also, you can just, with your own belief system, um, you are a little, little bit creative and you receive these vows for 24 hours. Because when we have vows, then we have much more courage to keep ethical conduct. Yeah. When you took a vow not to lie, even though it would be for your reputation much better uh, to lie when somebody, you know, you're a meditator and somebody says, you meditate every day? And it would be much better to say, yes, of course, but it's not true, um, you know? But then, because there's this vow, then you say, ah, yeah, I know I should, but I don't. 
so so like this. Um, when it's about the mosquitoes in your room, it's like no. You see, it gives us the freedom of no choice. We think choices are freedom. It's not. It's like it just makes us confused. Should I kill this thing or should I? It's no. Uh, when you fall in love with somebody that here, you know, you already have a partner.